Today we're going to talk about some of the unknown creators out there that, are, that were just, just as diligent doing what they did but did not receive the accolades for what they did. But before we can even begin that conversation, we have to start with a conversation that says, where did the images of us come from in the first place? How did they come about? What created them? And what made them so, re so resistant or, or are getting away from them so resistant or resistant to us overall? And to do that, we have to go back to when they first started. All right, 1915's Birth of a Nation, affectionately called the Clams, we marked a time in our history when we weren't allowed to even play ourselves in popular media productions. Instead, there were white actors that took burnt cork and black in their faces to play us and were even more, more than not more stereotypical than they were realistic. And here's an interesting thing. The gentleman you see in this picture, his name is Burt Williams. He was a Jamaican who had to put cork on his face to get work. Think of that concept. A black guy has to put cork on his face to get work as a black guy. Okay? This is, this is by and large, for the most part, a lot of how um, stuff with us worked back in the day. Now, if you take a look further down, you'll see Al Jolson and the jazz singer. And this, be, this also became a very, very stereotypical image of black people back in the day. And quite naturally, since, the, since most comic book art or most art in general reflects the sign of its times, if you look right underneath it, this was from a comic book, a comic strip of Mickey Mouse, where they actually mimicked that image. And I want you to take a look to the image on the, on the bottom lower right, or your right, my left, okay? That's a character called Little Eight Ball. Keep him in mind. Next slide. In the 1930s, Looney Tune and Mickey Mouse did those kind of things. In 1934, there was a comic strip called Mandrake the Magician, and there was a character they introduced in it called Lothar. This was one of the first attempts to actually humanize black people in this country. And what they did was is that they brought him in, and he was the king of seven nations, or the prince of seven nations. Now, think about this. I'm a magician, I come to your land, you're in line to be king of seven nations, and you decide that you want to be my sidekick. <laughs> Shouldn't that have been the other way around? <laughs> so for, for all intents and purposes, though, they drew him fairly humanistic, okay? And that was a good thing. That was a good thing. Lee Falk understood something, but even back then, about the nature of human beings and what people look for out in the world. You'll also notice that on the lower right-hand side, there's a character called Wacko. Because back at that time, Marvel was also looking at these things because when people are doing stuff, they don't work in a vacuum. So if I create a Star Wars, I can guarantee you there's going to be 15 ripoffs of Star Wars. So if I create a character like that that turns out to be a popular thing, you're going to get people that are going to also do that. Next slide. 1937, Jackie Orms. The thing that's really interesting about her, her name was Zelda Jackson when she was born. But she took on the name Jackie Arms. And she was one of the first females and, and is, is largely, um, she's largely perceived and largely received as being the first female, the black female African-American cartoonist. In 19, when she did her strips, she would actually engage in social issues. She would actually engage in social issues. Now, Early on, she did them fairly benign. But when this strip came, when, she, when they brought it back in the 1950s, she actually went full tilt head on and took on social issues such as racism, such as um, poverty, in the actual comic strip itself. OK, next one. But as it, as, as it is in the world, no good deed goes unpunished. So what happened is, is at that time, when, when people were actually starting to portray us in comic as being human, then there was a backlash. So people decided that what they were going to do is they were going to go back to the old original ideology and iconography of who we were. Note little eight ball. Not only did they do comic strips like this where they gave us the big head, the dark skins, the big lips, and the big eyes, they put it on planes and took it all the way around the world because they wanted the entire world to see us that way. Now I want you to understand something. I do not fault people for being who they are at a time when they don't know any better. Back then, most people did not know any better. Remember, that Birth of a Clan, that, that, that um, Birth of a Nation film, 
it basically set the standard for a lot of things in the way that people looked at things in the world. Did most of you know that the burning cross that most Klansmen began to use wasn't even originally theirs? It was done in that movie and they adopted it. There's a, a brilliant film out called 13 done by um, Ava DuVernay. If you get an opportunity, see that film. See that film. Rent it, download it, go on Netflix and watch that film because she explains the history of that and she's very, very succinct in how she does it. Okay, next one. Now, as I said, if you remember, even Stan Lee at the time, and this, this was when, before Marvel was Marvel when they were known as Timely Comics. As Timely Comics, he did a book called Young Allies and in Young Allies, they created a character called Washington Jones. And by the way, Washington Jones was the, his name, but the, what they called him in it was whitewashed. His name was Washington Whitewashed Jones. And for the most part, what he was used as is the guy that always had to be rescued. He always had to be rescued. He always had to be saved. He was always the one getting in trouble. And for all intents and purposes, he was used for, for comic relief. I don't want to, I, I, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say it. There's no nice way to say it. Comic relief. And for the most part, this is how characters re were treated over, over that time frame. Now, I want you to take a look at the one at the upper right, all the way on the side. That's the spirit. Underneath it, you'll see a character called Ebony White. Ebony White was drawn exactly like, or in the same iconography and stereotypical way as Whitewash Jones. There was one difference, though. The artist and creator of the spirit, Will Eisner, he had a different ideology about his character. So whereas he drew him like that, he actually had the character be more human in the way that he was interacted with in the story. And I had a 45 minute conversation with Will Eisner at a show once because I wanted to ask him about that. I said, Will, you're a hip guy. How could you even do that? Why didn't you rail against him? Why didn't you show them what, 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 what it should have been? He said, sign of the times. Those were his exact words. That was a quote. Those were his exact words. It was a sign of the times. He said, but I did at least, to my credit, at least have him be heroic, even in spite of the way he visually was portrayed. And that was true. Next. This gentleman's name's Calf, uh, Clarence Baker. This guy, I never knew he was black. Throughout his entire career, I never really knew he was black. But what he did was, is he specialized in what's known as good girl art. Because he knew that if you drew good girls, people would buy your books. <laughs> so they put him, he, he didn't even start on Phantom Lady, but he was the one that changed her and modified her so that she was as sexy as she is now. Now here's the sad part about that. At that time, and um, let me give you a date because I want to make sure that you know this. Now we're in uh, 1944. What happened was there was a gentleman by the name of Frederick Wortham who was writing a book called Seduction of the Innocents. And in Seduction of the Innocents, what he was trying to do was say that comic books led to juvenile delinquency because they had a juvenile delinquency problem in, this, in America, or at least they thought they did. And so what he did is he wrote a book called Seduction of the Innocents, and in that book, he said that comic books, by and large, caused people, young kids, to become juvenile delinquents. He had no scientific data to back that up. It was all based on, his, on, on supposition and innuendo on his part. But the phantom lady that's on the bottom left, all the way to the side, that was one of the images that he put in his book to say that this is one of the reasons why kids are juvenile delinquents, because they say women half naked in a comic book. Go figure. Go figure. Next one. Now we're in 1947. Now, here's a funny thing. Again, remember, things go in cycles with most people. You may start off one way with an image and a stereotypical way of seeing things, and then as you put that out into the world, people will rebel, and then they'll do something totally the opposite of that. So early we started with um, us being noble savages. Then we became like Lothar, not really that super intelligent yet, but at least we were looked at least human. Then they went back to the other stereotypical image, and now they said, well, wait a minute. There, there have been blacks that have done a lot of things in the world. But again, we're not necessarily heroes, but what they did decide to do is that they decided that what they would do is, is that they would actually start to show people that were real life and out in the world. So now they started doing comic books about sports figures, our science guys, and things along those lines because they were safe. 
And they, were, they basically, that's exactly what it was. It was all about being safe. Few publishers did comic books with more positive portrayals of black characters than they did. Paris Magazine Institute published Negro's Heroes in the spring of 1947, but the title would only go two issues. There was not enough people that was buying them. And it was um, from reprints after that point that they started doing it, and then they started doing more stuff along those lines where they would actually get stuff that was already being printed in newspapers, and they would compile them and put them into books. Okay, next one. In 1950, oh, let me, let me go to here. In, 19, in 1950, Fawcett did a book called um, um, Negro Romance, which was the other side of that. But in June of 47, a bunch of creators that, were work, that was working for a newspaper called The Record decided that what they were going to do is they were going to produce a comic book that featured not only all black writers and artists, but all black characters. And this book was called All Negro Comics. And it was published in June of 1947. It's the first comic book to be published by black Americans to feature black characters and black creators and may also be the first independent book ever produced. African-American journalist Orrin Cromwell Evans decided that it was time that black people had a comic book. So he produced this book. He got a bunch of his people from the newspaper of like mind and they produced a comic book. One of the things about this comic book that I found to be very, very interesting is that some of the, they actually had superheroes in it, they had detectives in it, they had one little cute story with these two little cherub-like little kids that had little wings, and it was kind of really very, very nice. You know, it's one of those really, like, kidsy things. And when I was reading it, it was funny because when I first found out about this, you couldn't find this book anywhere. I had heard, I'd, I'd seen one write-up on it, one sentence in a paragraph, and then I started searching on the internet for it. And it actually took me over a year and a half to find any imaging from it. And then I found some imaging from it because somebody had an issue that they were trying to sell online. So now what a guy has done is he scanned the entire book and he's now got the entire book online. So I downloaded it right away, the entire book. Because I want to have a history and a, and a, a record of all the books that have been done by African-American creators and African-American people that feature African-American characters. I want to actually create an archive where we have that, that entire thing laid out where people can go and they can see it in a historical context of how it goes you know, from year to year to year to year to year. And this is something I, I'm pretty sure already I'm, I'm going to have to dedicate my life to because I had no idea there was as much out in the world as there is with this. All right, thank you. Next one. This book, this book is called Treasure Chest of Fun and Fact. Most people may not know, have never, have may never have heard of this book. Um, don't mind me, I'm just a little bit nervous. It's been a moment since I've given this lecture, so I'm trying to, to, to remember all of the stuff and the research that I did because I'm, I'm doing research beyond, far beyond this now. This book, the most interesting thing about it is, this book was an anthology title. So in this book, there were usually about eight to 10 stories. This was one story called 17... Uh, 1976. So remember, this book was done in the 1950s. This was 1957. So they were postulating 20 years into the future what a presidential campaign would look like. And in that presidential campaign, you never saw the opposing character. You never saw him. His name was Pettigrew, and you never saw him. They would always have him hidden behind a tree or a lamp or a post. So for the entire 10 issues that it ran, you never saw that it was a black candidate. So think about this. Catholic charities in 1957 thought by 1976 we would have black people running for president or running for the nomination. How, out, how outrageous is that in this day and age where we actually now have had a black president? Even though it was from 57 to <laughs> that far removed. So does that mean if you're like a Catholic school kid, you're going to be like ahead of your time, progressive? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, I was a Catholic little kid, so I'm saying yes. <laughs> okay? And in it, they just showed him winning the nomination. That, and they left it open-ended as to whether or not he would have actually won the presidency. So now we know today that we can actually have one that can win the presidency. Okay? Thank you. Along with that also, in uh, 1965, we're going to skip ahead of this a little bit. This was the first actual comic book that actually featured a black character in a lead role and as the lead of the book. 
Up until then, you had a lot of characters like Waku, for instance, ran in the back of some issues. So you have a lot of other characters that they would put in as part of an anthology story or in a story. But this was the first book that actually, outside of all Negro comics, where they actually had a lead black character in the book. The thing that's very interesting about this also is that it was done by what was considered at that time a major publisher. Dell used to be a major player in the book, in the book space, in the publishing space, in the paperback space, and in the comic book space. And this was something I didn't know either. When I was a kid, we, we used to laugh at the Dell books. They'd have like painted covers and then they'd have some story on the inside. We'd look at that and say, okay, that's nice, that's cute, but we're going to Marvel in DC. But I had no idea about the history of Dell until I saw this book and I started reading up on what, what Dell did and what else they produced. Because my attitude is if they're producing this, do they have black females? Do they have, you know, Hispanic females? Do they have, so I'm, I'm trying to see everything that they have and unfortunately, this was it, all right? But this was, for all intents and purposes, the first book to feature a black character. So all of you people who thought Luke Cage was it, you are wrong. <laughs> For those of you who know Luke Cage is from Marvel. All right? Next one. Now, when that book came out, I'm going to tell you one quick, quick, quick aside. When that book came out, the general print run on that book was 200,000, which was its standard print run for Dell at the time. Those books were, were sent out, and, and most comic book companies are working three months in advance. So they're basically working on their third book before that first book comes out. This one, they put out the first one, and then they started working on the second one. When they, when they went to look at the, the numbers and the returns, the sales, they were noticing that the books were not selling. And they're like, well, why aren't the books selling? And back in that day, they had what was known as returnables. In other words, you'd rip off the cover, send the book back, and you'd get credit for your next purchase. So what happened was, the books were coming back with all the covers ripped off. And they, and they were wondering, well, why isn't this book selling? It should, this book should be selling like hotcakes. And what happened was is that it would get to the retail outlets, and the retail outlet guys would look at the books, I'm not selling this. I'm not selling that. It's a black character. I'm not selling that. Now, here's what I'm thinking. Me, well, again, knowing who I am, if, I, if somebody sent a book to me like that, I would have looked at it and said, if, if there's a chance for it to sell, let's put it out and see if it does. If it does, what am I making? I'm making money. You understand? I'm not trying to not make money. I'm, I'd be want to make money. But they were not going to forward a, a black comic book character. So they were sending the books back. So by the time they got to the second issue, and they finished the second issue, and a friend of mine actually purchased it. He purchased a copy of the second issue. And again, I scanned the crap out of that. So now I have that in my archive. Okay? So I have the, the first one and second one archived already. And because they sent those books back, the publisher said, listen, nobody's buying this, so we're not going to continue to put out money for 200,000 print runs, and nobody's going to buy it. So that ended that. So then we had two issues, and that was the end of that. But the interesting thing was the fact that they actually got that book to the stands made an impact on the industry. So now what happens is Marvel looked out there and said, well, maybe there is time. Maybe we need to have a black character out there. Maybe we should. So they reached that back in their archives, and they pulled a book out called Wack Who. Remember him from back in the 19... 30s? So they brought him back. But now they were not really, really willing to give him in his own book just yet. So they said, well, we'll do it as an anthology title. And, and as an anthology title, they'd have a bunch of different stories, and Waku's story was just one of them. So they put it in there. And here's the funny thing. People liked it fine. It wasn't as if they ran away from it or got away from it or didn't like it or didn't want to read it. So they said, well, wait a minute. Now I wonder. Then along comes a gentleman by the name of Jack Kirby who had been working for them who had made Captain America popular. Thor popular, and Fantastic Four popular, and he said, you know what, we need to have a black character. So he wanted to call the Black, um, the black Panther initially, he wanted to call him Cold Tiger. Stanley said, Cold Tiger? I don't think so. He said, we got to give him something that's a little more powerful, a little more fantastic. And so they came up with Black Panther. And initially, the original Black Panther costume, the face was open, just like a regular superhero where you could see the skin. Stanley figured, well, you know what, let's not push that. Let's cover him up. Let's get people into the story. Let's let people read the story and get connected to the character. And then they'll realize who he is. So that's why you have Black Panther in the all-black outfit. And when it came out in the book, it turned out that it was a hit. It turned out to be a very, very phenomenal book in terms of their selling structure. And at that point, they realized they, they had a hit on their hands. So they decided that they were going to actually start to do some stuff with him. Now, from 1966, and this book was done in 1966, in 1969, they decided, now let's actually create a black character and people will know he's black from the very beginning. This is where the Falcon came in. And by the way, 
The Falcon came in because he was recruited by the Red Skull to help the exiles defeat Captain America. They put him on an island. The Red Skull used the Cosmic Cube to steal Steve Rogers' identity. And what he did was, is he, just, he said, well, I'll become Cap, and I'll put Cap on this island, and they'll kill him, and then I'll just be Cap, and I'll ruin his reputation, I'll ruin everything. They put him on this island. He runs across Falcon one day on the island, and, and he's like, who are you? And he's like, well, who are you? And so they started talking. And Falcon said, they, they have me here to kill some guy. And he says, I know, I'm that guy. And he says, but I don't really want to kill anybody. He says, but I don't know what I can do. He said, I know what you can do. You can fight him. He says, I, don't, I can't fight. I don't know anything about that. So Cap says, I do. Let me train you. So Falcon and Cap, in, in secret, were training each other so that they could take on the exiles and then take on the Red Skull. Now, if any of you know anything about heroes in comics, do the heroes win? So did they win? Absolutely. But in that, when they were fighting, he said, Falcon, you need to have an outfit. And at that time, Falcon already had the bird. Red Wing was his bird or his friend on the island. So as such, he decided he'd take on the name of the bird, which was a falcon. So he did. And the interesting thing was, is when they fought, he said, you need to have an outfit and you need to give yourself a name. He said, call me the falcon. And there was Falcon. So they fought, they won, and they got off the island. And again, they had a hit in the Falcon character. And they brought him back a couple of times in Captain America's book. So from 1969 to 1972, still no real major black presence in the major comic book industry. But now they looked up and said, you know what? We need to have a dedicated book specifically to a black character. Now, Remember, none of this stuff happens in a vacuum. So outside of that, what happened? You had the black exploitation films that were happening during that time frame. Anybody remember Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song, Five on the Black Hand Side? Yeah, so now guess who's going to the movies? Black people. And let me tell you a little, again, another little aside. When Mario Van Peebles attempted to take Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song and get it into the distribution net, Nobody would buy it. Nobody was, was, nobody was going for it. There were two little guys, there were two Jewish guys, I think it was in Chicago, who had a, a movie theater that was failing. And so when he came to them, he called them, he said, listen, since the distributors aren't doing it, he's decided he's going to call all the movie houses to see if he could get it in there. Nobody was listening. These two guys, their movie theater was failing, they were going to lose it. So they said, you know what, what the heck, we got nothing to lose. We'll run it for a week and see how it does. So they took Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song, put it in that movie theater, and within one showing, had lines around the block four people deep. So now, of course, Hollywood, when they're getting the numbers back, okay, from, from, from their tracking sheets, it's like, well, wait a minute, all of our movies are flatlining. How come this movie's doing so well? So they sent a representative out there and they said, yeah, we're running this black film. So they said, really? Wow. So the black exploitation theory of film began. Now everybody wants to put a black film out. Why? Because black, they realized that there was a market out there that they had never ever looked at as being a market. And again, to me, smart businessmen, when you're looking at dollars and cents, you're not looking at color, you're looking at dollars and cents. And if 15 people in this, if, if, if everybody in here was an elf and they were paying to come in here to see this, trust me, I'm making an elf movie. <laughs> okay, let's be real. Okay, let's be real. I'm making an elf movie. So that's what happened. So Marvel looked up at that and they said, maybe we should be, make a black comic book dedicated with a black lead character. We'll be the first in history. They didn't remember Lobo. They didn't remember all Negro comics. So Marvel actually marketed it just like that. The first black character to have his own book. And the book sold well. The book sold well. So DC, their competitors, looked at that and said, well, wait a minute. This, is, this can't be possible. That book is doing well. It's doing good. So what did they do? They created Black Lightning. <laughs> and by the way, a friend of mine named Trevor Von Eden, some of his work is in the back end, which we found to be very, very interesting. He was the guy that br was brought in to draw that book. And guess what? They did, they did something totally unusual. Usually they're looking for people that have a lot of cred and a lot of history in doing comics. Trevor Von Eden was 16 years old when he drew that issue. 16 years old. So now they had the opportunity to have a, a double coup. Number one, they had a black character, and, it's, and not only was it a black character, whereas theirs was drawn by white men, ours is drawn by a young black guy. 
And that's how they marketed it. And all I can say to that is, is what Trevor told me. He said, God bless them. <laughs> God bless them. Next one. Now, across the pond in England, they were looking at this phenomenon in America called the black exploitation um, era. They were looking at the fact that black books were now in the, in the mainstream and were selling. And they decided, well, we need to do one too. So they decided to do a book called Power Comics. Or actually, the book was really called Power Man. This is a compilation of it when they finally did it again and brought it back in, in, in this form. Now, the character that they originally had was a character called Power Man. And his only weakness was snakes. Now, don't get me wrong. I have that same weakness. <laughs> OK? And I'm pretty sure if I threw a snake on the floor, a lot of you would show us that you have it too. But outside of that, he did it. And, and here's the thing. They wanted to market this to schools in Nigeria. They were producing it in England. And Brian Boland, who went on to later to do Watchmen, was the artist in a lot of the stories. And they wanted to take it into the school systems and into the market in Nigeria to sell. And so that's what they did. And that's what they did. OK, next one. Thank you. Now. Again, as I say, nothing ever happens in a vacuum. So what happens is a lot of black creators were looking at that time, and they were saying to themselves, well, wait a minute. They're doing books about our characters. Why aren't we doing books about our characters? Why aren't we doing conventions, comic conventions, where we're bringing in a lot of black creators to show what black creators are doing? Because again, we're part of, the, we're part of this gestalt. So we, we're looking at this stuff and what we're doing. Dave and I were creating stuff all along that time frame, OK? crude because we didn't have the, the expertise at the time back then but we were looking at all of that and we we're influenced by it also so just as we were influenced so were a lot of other people but a lot of other people had much more experience than us and because they had much more experience than us they were bringing a lot more heat to the, to the table and because of such a gentleman by the name of Tuttle only his career has touched upon a variety of disciplines in fine art, applied art, visual art, producing works in painting, drawing, illustration, publishing, fashion, multimedia production. So what he, it was quite naturally that his attitude was, well, wait a minute. Why don't we create an entire movement around this so that we can actually have stuff that we can say is our own? And so that's what he did. Tootle only was, for all intents and purposes, the grandfather of the black comic book movement. He started organizing shows and organizing conventions and having creators and inviting black creators in so that they could actually show the stuff that they were doing. And in doing that, he opened up an entire wellspring of what was available to everyone here. Now, at some point, I'm going to, each one of the people on this slide is going to have their own slide, okay? Because when I was doing it, Back in the day, I realized that they were very, very small. And you can't really see who they are, and you can't really see a lot of their work. But to give you an example, the guy just a, a little bit above um, to the lonely is a guy by the name of Jerry Kraft. He does a, a, a syndicated strip called Mama's Boys, which talks about a mother raising two young boys. And it's a, it's a very cute comic strip. The gentleman right under that is Al Simmons. Al Simmons has opened up a connection between African-American creators and Africa, where he goes over there and he does a thing called KidsCon, where he teaches young African kids about comics and how to do them, and the comics as they exist in, on every other nation and planet here. Planet? Well, we only got one planet. But I'm sure if he could get into outer space, he would. Because Al is that kind of guy. He's very forward thinking. And he created a character called Blackjack, which is about a black adventurer in the 1930s who actually met Tarzan in the Tarzan syndicated strip, because he got to write for that for a minute, so he brought his character into that, which is very, very interesting. Then we have Felix, who's on the whole, all the way on the other side, up at the top, a little small picture of Felix. He does a lot of stuff in the New York area where he does conventions for a lot of create ind independent creators, primarily Latino in nature, Latino and Hispanic. But he invites us in because he's, he gives a nod. So, that's how I met him. Underneath them, in the far right-hand corner, the gentleman under the bottom with the head rag on, his name is Mashindo Kumba. You, mo you may want to remember that. This guy is, for all intents and standards, what I tell people is the gold standard for what we're trying to do. If I could draw like him right now, oh, you, you, trust me, all of my work would be in this building. <laughs> all of my work would be in this building. 
This guy, for all intents and purposes, is, 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 is what we're aiming at. That level of quality, that level of sophistication, that level of coloring, human, humanness in terms of the way that he draws, that's what we're aiming at. And he has some stuff that's coming out over the next two years, and I can't say anything about it, unfortunately. But it's some of the most beautiful stuff I have ever seen in my life. If any of you are familiar with a gentleman by the name of Alex Ross, he was Alex Ross before Alex Ross was Alex Ross. Okay? He's that good. And so he's going to be bringing stuff to the table and out into the world. Now, he has stuff out now, but he, we, we need to get him in a book. We need to get him into something that we can get into kids' hands. Once that happens, the, the game will be changed. The game will be changed. Next slide. Now, along, along this time frame, since Tootle only opened up that door, quite naturally there's going to be somebody that's going to actually step through it and say, you know what? We need to do something else. This character was the first statement where this guy decided that he was going to create a character that actually spoke to the actual black dysphoria in America. And this character is called Brother Man. Now I'm going to tell you why I haven't mentioned his name. Guy Sims is the guy that wrote it. The guy that drew it is named Dawood Annie Yab Wiley. That's why I try not to say his name too much. So I'm going to just call him Dawood and we'll leave it at that. All right? But when he drew this character, he took it to the New York Expo in 1990. And at the New York Expo, a three-day event, he sold 70,000 units. What he showed was that black comic books could make money. They could sell, and it didn't have to come from a major publisher. That was the statement that he made. In addition to that, this book did so well that it was featured on Arsenio Hall. And what Arsenio Hall said was this. If this character, and that image you see down there on the, on the bottom left, or your bottom right, that was the image he flashed on his screen behind him. He said, they say that the sales of Superman are not doing well. Maybe if Superman looked like this, he'd sell more. Those, and that's a quote. Next slide. So now, of course, after that, what did Black Pies do? Well, wait a minute. If this guy could do it, we can do it. And here's the thing. The interiors of the Brother Man book were all black and white just like um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, black color covers, black and white interiors, so was that. These guys came along and decided, we don't need one book, we need a line. So they decided they were gonna create a line of books. And this was called Ania. And I forget what their, their, their promotional thing was, all, what is it, all black creators, all black art, all black, all black, all black, and so much. Was, they put so much black in their first advertisement that was like, wow, gee, I guess they're a black company. <laughs> but here's the funny thing. They ran into the, the same problem that most creators run into when they're trying to create products. They produced the first books, they put them out, and they got a lot of press all across the country. Um, the guy that did um, Zawana, Son of Zulu, he used to actually dress up like a Zulu warrior and he would climb the size of Capitol buildings and have a flag up there to generate publicity to people buy his book. And what happens was is that they ran into the problem that most creators run into that think that they're going to actually create a book, make money, and then do more. So most of these books ended up not getting past their third issue because the creators could not keep up. The one book that was an exception to that was a book called Purge, and that was done by Roosevelt Pitt, and that book is still being published today. In fact, he just released a graphic novel just this past summer and this, this past fall. Now, out of this company comes this one. This is the company most people will know as being the preeminent and the standard by which all black comic book companies will be judged from here on out. This was Milestone Media. It was headed by Dwayne McDuffie, Dennis Cowan, David Dingle, who worked for Black Enterprise Magazine, and uh, Ed Davis. Ed Davis and Dennis Cowan I both know, and I got to meet Dwayne McDuffie because when they first started Milestone Media, and I saw it, I said, I want, I want to know about this. So I went down to the offices and met McDuffie. And one of the things he said to me at that point, he said, there's a lot of creators out here that want to be in this business, but not a lot of them are very good. So that means you go home, you work, and you get good. One of the guys that worked with us, a guy by the name of um, Ernie, he actually worked for them. But I'm going to tell you, again, as I tell you, most creators are what? They are a lazy lot. 
So they would give him stuff because Ernie would come in and he would do just a little bit of work and they wanted to push him to find out, to find out who he was and to find his artistic voice. And Ernie's whole thing, when he would come to our meetings, he'd be like, man, they ain't giving me nothing to do. They're giving me all this crap. Da, 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 da. We used to tell him, just do it. Just do it. If it's, if, it's, if it's so trivial, just do it. Well, he never did and they ultimately didn't use him because of it. But he, was at, he would have been in there when they were first getting started and he didn't see what was possible. So he didn't do it. But anyway, when they did this, they actually set the standard and they worked out one of the most beautiful distribution deals with DC Comics. They maintained all the rights to their characters to this day. DC distributed it through their distribution network and paid them a fee. So all they had to do was produce the books, get them into the pipeline, make money, right through DC. And DC was being carried by every major retailer on the planet. Not just in this country, but worldwide. Now, I'm going to tell you a little interesting thing that happened with that. As with anyone else, when you start to get a lot of notoriety in this business, when, a good, when, a, when good opportunities come your way, you want to take them on. So what happened? Motown Records at the time decided they wanted to go into animation. So what did they do? They reached out to these guys to help them form Motown Animation, which is why you now have, a, you have the Static Shock animated series. That's where it came from. It came from them and this, because they did Milestone. Next slide. Now, in addition to that, everybody looked at what Ania did and then looked at what Milestone did, and of course, how could we not do it ourselves? We couldn't. We had to. We were compelled. So what I did is there's a, guy, a group there called Watch Out Magazine. That's how I met this gentleman, Dave McLean. Was, he was, doing, was at Watch Out a generation after me. And we were, we were being taught the comic book industry by a gentleman by the name of Don Brown, who's no longer with us. But he opened the door to showing us that we too could do this stuff. All right? Underneath that is a book called Still I Rise. And to the left of that is a book called MC Squared. This is the first hip hop comic book ever. And how do I know? Because they came to me to have me do it. And I could, we, couldn't, we could never work out the financial thing. So they got another guy by the name of Alufu Bey to do the artwork for them. And, and, and until the day that he passed, he and I were in, co in communication and good friends. All right? The thing that's really interesting also out of that is there's a gentleman by the name of Dwayne Ferguson that did a book called Captain Africa. Because he felt that if you're going to have a book about Africans and featuring African Americans, it should have Africa somewhere in the title. So he did a book called Captain Africa. But his claim to fame wasn't through this book. It was through a book called Hamster Vice, which floated an entire line of books called Blackthorn for over two years while they were forming. His book was the book that people bought, and that's why they were able to do their line of books out in California. Underneath that is a girl by the name of Rashida Lewis, who did a book called Sandstorm. And she also worked for us through a company called Beatnik, which are the four books that you see up in the upper left with the green behind it. And the culprit book we have, we have re we printed copies of it in the back for you today so that you could take them home and you can read a real story because I'm going to tell you what we wanted to do. In addition to doing a comic book story, we wanted to actually do a real novel. We wanted to say, what would happen if you put a real novel in a comic book? I mean, a real story, something that when people read it, you, can't, you don't just read it and brush through it, but you actually read it like a novel, but it just has illustrations. So that's what we did. And in doing that story, we vetted it all throughout Pennsylvania, because we figured Pennsylvania would be the toughest market for a black guy in a black company. And you'll read on the back of it what they said about that book and how well they liked it. So we were like, yes, yes. So we need to compile all of this in one big volume so that people can get it all at one time, the whole story all at one time. And so that's what we did. And underneath it, underneath that, you'll see a book called um, PB Soldier. That's one of my partners that's going to be launching the line with me in 2017. His name is um, Nasid Gifted. And the next book over is Star Angels, which is also going to be one of the first books that, that's coming from our line in 2017, uh, February of 2017, actually. Next slide. In addition to this, I was not satisfied with, it, with there just being a comic book. And by the way, I want you to understand this. At a certain point, you start to realize that, we, again, we don't work in a vacuum. Because we don't work in a vacuum, the digital age was upon us. So we decided what we were going to do is we were going to create some digital online content that people could read for free. Now, this would operate as a promotional tool for us. It would also operate as a thing where we would have content that we could actually put into books down the line. 
And so that's what we did. So we launched a DAP project in 2013, and we've been doing roughly about 2,000 to 3,000 hits a month. Well, actually, it's a week, if I'm not, not mistaken, where people are coming in. And it's funny because the creators, we have creators, and when, you, when each one of them gets that, that higher hit, everybody tries to act like, oh, no, it's not about the hits. It's not about this until somebody else beats them. <laughs> <laughs> then it's like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We, it's, it's not really about the hits, and it's like, well, I'm coming for you. <laughs> you know? So we wanted, we wanted it to be competitive because that's how you get better. Competition breeds excellence. So if people are competitive, they will, they will step up in excellence or they'll get gone because that's the way that this industry works.